everybody point to 11.30, you can start taking photos. Where's 11.30? Right off the nose. That's a wash rack. Here's a great big 50-year-old tanker. That's an R model. That's, you see those huge, most of these are E models. That's an R. They're starting to store those 50-year-old guys. But immediately on your left is an F-16 fighting falcon. Thunderbirds fly that. The Vietnam era F-4 there has four stars indicate Captain Steve Ritchie was an Air Force ace. That one plus one more I'll show you in a moment were flown to Nellis Air Force Base, 1997. President Truman, September 18, 1947, made the Air Force a separate service. Back to that tanker there, that's an R model, that's unusual coming into, but Boeing aircraft finally, about a year ago, won a contract to replace those 50-year-old tankers. They're taking Boeing 767s, they're gonna be called the KC-46. In 2017, they're gonna start delivering 279 brand new tankers. The third building on your left houses the commander's office. Told you an Air Force Colonel. We come back by the wash rack in a minute. We'll take another look. Changes every hour. Immediately on your left at 11.30 are rows after a row of F-16 fighting Falcons. There are about 70 of these over at Tucson International Airport. In 1989, the Netherlands were the first to send their pilots to learn to fly this airplane on your left under the Foreign Military Sales Training Site. Since that time, United Arab Emirates, Norway, Denmark, Thailand, Poland, Turkey, Chile, Japan, Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, many of their pilots come to learn to fly this airplane at Tucson International Airport. Also on your left, these are the same F-16s. In a few years, we're all going to be shot down. I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. Coming up on the right is an MC-130. Then on its left there at about 1 o'clock or 5, Royal Norwegian C-130s. Norway has retired those here in the process of trying to sell them. Yes, I'm going to have to have you but please be seated. Maybe on your left are some jet engine cans. We have quite a few of them. These rusted cans each have a jet engine in there. Locks have been taken out. Nitrogen is pumped in to store that valuable jet engines. Now look about 100 yards at 9 o'clock. you see those open cans? You're going to see some more open ones down here. AMARG is getting ready, ready to destroy these can engines right here on your left. But before they do that, they're going to take titanium, gold, silver out of those engines. Now Doug is getting ready to bring us up to Celebrity Road. But look on your right. You see that spray light on those airplanes? If that looks new, these are the ones that came in and came directly to that parking area and spray light in that present position. Well, here's Celebrity Road. Nine o'clock is an OV-1 Mohawk 1950s reconnaissance airplane for the Army. The blue-tailed airplane coming up on the right is an S-3 Viking. Used to be the submarine hunter for the Navy. They no longer use it for that. They now use it for reconnaissance. Maybe on your left is an S-2 Tracker 1950s submarine hunter for the Navy. And at 10 o'clock is an SH-60 Navy helicopter. Now that looks very much like the Army Black Hawk. Now the Air Force Pave Hawks stationed here at DM looks just like that Seahawk. Except the Air Force ones have a great big refueling probe on the right side for in-flight refueling. There's a Beechcraft airplane at 10 o'clock used by embassies around the world. On your right is a C-1 Trader. Used to be the COD airplane, C-O-D, carrier on board delivery. The Navy folks on a ship months at a time used to love to see this little baby come on board because it brought cargo, personnel, and that very important item, U.S. mail. 10 o'clock's an H-3C King, used to be the submarine hunter for the United Kingdom. They no longer use it for that, they now use it 
for reconnaissance. I understand our Canadian friends do use this as a uh, anti-submarine hunter. That H2C Sprite with the yellow tail at 9 o'clock was supposed to be the submarine hunter for the country of Australia. They received nine of their 20 and they ran into a safety problem and they canceled that program. The next two helicopters, the 53 and 46, being used extensively in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, some of those are being knocked out of the sky. AMR is regenerating those type helicopters to replace them. About one o'clock is an E2C Hoka, nicknamed the Hummer. That radon revolves six revolutions per minute. Takes off from a Navy carrier, greatly extends the radar range of the carrier task fleet. Now at three o'clock or three thirty is the E2C. It's also a sea airplane, but has a new D engines on it. Look at that great big eight-bladed prop. Understand that little guy was very difficult. He basic C to land on the carrier that gave it much better performance throughout its hopper plus takeoff and landing off the carrier. I'm gonna get dubbed to put these three combat helicopters right in the middle of the bus. That Iroquois, also known as the Huey, used in Vietnam. The Sea Cobra is a twin engine couple marine helicopter has a three-barrel, 20-millimeter cannon in the nose, and then you're looking down the nose of the famous Huey Cobra. That is a world's first attack helicopter. It has two 7.62-millimeter gun total missile capability. Now, when you look down the nose of those three helicopters, you can see why that broad profile of the Iroquois was very vulnerable in, for small arms fire. Then we came up with that narrow silhouette, much more highly survival in a highly defended area. 10 o'clock looks like another Viking, but this has an E in front of it. Stands for electronic. This is called the Shadow, has over 60 electronic antennas. At 11 o'clock is an A4 Skyhawk, nicknamed the Scooter. That red star and camouflage scheme on that airplane is a Soviet camouflage. That airplane was used by the Top Gun Navy Aggressor Squadron. They would take it off, fly Soviet tactics against Navy pilots to teach them what they may encounter in an adversarial situation. Nine o'clock's a T-34C. It's trained thousands of Navy pilots to learn to fly for many years. Now rapidly coming out of service, being replaced by a turboprop T-6 Texan II. I'm going to show you an Air Force T-37 twin jet called the Tweet, built by Cessna. Did the same thing for over 50 years for the Air Force, all out of service, also being replaced by the Air Force with that T-6 Texan II. T-2 Buckeye used to be the follow-on trainer for the Navy. No longer use it for that. They now use a United Kingdom design T-45 Gossel being built by Boeing for advanced Navy training. On your right is a huge YC-50. Boeing built two of these. The second one is our museum. Competed against a huge McDonnell Douglas YC-15 many years ago didn't happen primarily because of budget, but the prototype of that YC-15 was evolved into the huge C-17, huge cargo airplane, replaced the C-141 years ago. The last airplane on the right before we take a little break is another C-130. Told you about the two types that operate out of DM. Would you believe this airplane today is being produced? doing that for over 50 continuous years, well over 2,400 United Kingdom, Canada represented on this bus as well as countries around the world operate this airplane. Would you believe it has the distinction of the longest continuous production of any military airplane? Nine o'clock's a TC-4C. The nose of that looks like an A6. I'll show you in a moment. It is. It can train as many as 
six Navy trainees to operate the systems of the 86. Coming up at 11.30, probably one of the finest Air Force fighters ever built, the F-15 This airplane has more thrust than weight, which means a pilot can take it off, stand it on its tail, and accelerate going straight up. Now, this airplane was designed in the 70s and 80s. Many of them are coming into storage, but it too is being produced this very day. About a year ago, Saudi Arabia signed a brand new contract for 84 brand new F-15s called the F-15SA. They're going to upgrade their 70 F-15s for a $30 billion contract. 10 o'clock, F-100 Super Savior. You're looking to world's first jet fighter that can maintain supersonic flight and level flight. Years ago, we were able to get the F-86 through the sound barrier, but we had to be going downhill to do it. This is the world's first one that could do it. Italy built this C-27 on the right. HW on the tail of that airplane stands for Harvard Air Force Base in Panama. The Air Force bought 10 of these, used throughout Panama in the 1990s. When the Panamanians took Howard back in 1999, these were all brought into storage, now going to be used by the U.S. State Department for anti-drug interdiction. Now the Air Force is starting to buy 38 brand new C-27Js for the Air Force Air National Guard. But there's the second F-4 at 10 o'clock. Coming up on the right is a very unusual C-130. This airplane on your right was on an airfield in South Vietnam in 1972. Took a mortar shell through the number three engine. The mechanics quickly replaced it. On takeoff, it took more armor. It staggered to a thousand feet. Finally got to a safe haven. And it was awarded an honorary plaque with a line. Part of it, which is in the cockpit of that. 9 o'clock, F-101 Voodoo, outstanding air defense fighter during the Cold War, helped defend North America against potential enemy fighters and bombers. 11 o'clock, beautiful F-18 Blue Angels airplane. This is a B model. The Blue Angels are retiring their A and B models by new C and D ones. Now this one has seven on the tail, which stands, tells me it's the narrator's airplane. He would fly to an air show, he would give narration in that air show, he would give VIP flights in that area, and also serve as a spare if one of the prime Blue Angels went out of business. 10 o'clock F-106 Delta Dart. This is the second Delta Wing fighter for the Air Force. The first one was the F-102. Both outstanding air defense fighters. And on its left is an F-8 Navy oh, really? airplane. This is the first Navy airplane that exceeded 1,000 miles. On your right is a DC-130. Told you C-130s were used for everything. That one has a D in front of it. Can control as well as another F-16. This was being developed in the 70s and 80s. It was the Air Force's first fly-by-wire fighter. Most airplanes used to use cables when you pull and push on the controls and move the ele elevators, motors, and so on. This is the Air Force's first one that used computer or electronic signals. Henceforth, it was given the nickname, the electric jet. On your right is another 130. Look where the gear goes on that airplane. These are skis. This is an LC-130. You may remember October 1999, a woman scientist had a medical problem in Antarctica. The New York Air National Guard flew an airplane like this and made one of the earliest landings ever in Antarctica. Rescued that woman scientist and took her back to Christchurch, New Zealand. Unfortunately, her cancer recurred and she passed away about 10 years later in 2009. Well, our United Kingdom folks should recognize this airplane on the map. Designed by our British friends. We modified it quite a bit. B-57 Canberra, built by Martin for the United States Air Force. 
Coming up about one o'clock, OF on the tail of an EC-135 is called a looking glass airplane. Would you believe this airplane, plus many others just like it, from the 60s to the 90s were flown out of Hoffman Air Force Base. Had a general flag officer on board at all times. They orbited 365 days a year, 24-7. They had the no code to move. If the underground command post had been knocked out and off it, the president could have communicated with these general flag officers and executed the war effort. 10 o'clock, outstanding F-4 and F-14 top 10. Swept wing, 2.4 mile swept wing fighter bomber. Had an outstanding career for the Navy for many years. Now all out of service, being replaced by the F-18 Super Hornet. Now at 9 o'clock, another F-14 says Tomcat. That's what the nickname, but many of the folks called it the Bomb Cat. Because that one at 9 o'clock was converted for air to ground fighter. Another A4. This is a Marine A4. I'm going to get Doug to put this A10 Warthog right in the middle of the bus. While he does that, I'm going to talk about this one of a kind airplane on the right. DC 24. DC 8 civilian life. The only one ever produced, used by the Navy for exercise issues. Now, Doug has put this A10 Warthog at 9 o'clock. This is a prime airplane that operates out of DM. Almost every pilot that flies that airplane today for the Air Force is trained right here at DM. Not only do they train airplanes and fighter pilots at A-10, they also have a fighter wing. That fighter wing today is TDY, temporary duty in Afghanistan, flying combat daily. Now you're looking down a 30 barrel, uh, seven barrel, 30 millimeter Gatling gun. Look at the gear, nose gear. It's off to the right. That's kind of unusual, is it not? I'm going to pass this around, but the reason that gun is off, nose gear is off to the right, the gun inside that airplane is the size of the Volkswagen Beetle. I'm going to pass this around in a moment. It consumes a whole front of the airplane all the way back to the wing room. It fires a shell like this, would you believe, with a depleted uranium nose. It weighs between two and two and a half pounds. With a titanium depleted uranium nose, it will burn through seven to eight inches of armor. That's how that airplane type killed over a thousand tanks in Desert Storm 1. Would you believe the rate of fire of that gun is 70 a second? 4,200 every minute. It is so lethal, the pilot squeezes his trigger about a second and a half will kill almost anything. I'm going to pass this around, send it all the way back on the driver's side, across the aisle, back up the driver's side. There's titanium around the engines, so it's underneath the cockpit to protect them from small arms fires. 10 o'clock, here's the nose of the A6 I showed you earlier. Workhorse for the Navy in the Vietnam War. Anybody know what that thing sticking out of the windscreen might be? Refueling proof pulls up behind a tanker trailing a gasoline hose. It looks like this. Bushel basket pilot flies a probe into the drone. 10 o'clock, A3 Sky Warrior. When this is flying for the Navy, is the largest, heaviest fighter armor to operate from a Navy carrier. Henceforth, it was given the nickname the Whale. On your right is a commercial airplane that was converted for Navy use DC 9. Both the Navy and the Air Force, most of theirs were called C-9s. Most services retired by Boeing 737s and replacing them. 10 o'clock is another A-7 Corsair when you came into our museum. You saw the Air Force. On your right is a Boeing 737 T-43 in military life. Look on the tail of that airplane over there. Right. Don't stop right here. RA stands for Randolph Air Force Base out in San Antonio, Texas. Two years ago, last September the 17th, this airplane was taken out of service. Many others just like it. For years and years, they trained Air Force and Navy Navy. But two years ago, last September 17th, these were all brought into storage. Now the Air Force has taken that job moved it to Naval Air Station, Pensacola, Florida. There the Air Force takes a T-1 J-Hawk, T-6 Action 2, train Air Force, Navy, Marine, Navigators. 10 o'clock.
Fox, a, an outstanding illustration of our technology, the F-117 Stealth Fighter. <laughs> kind of hard to see, but if you squint real hard. Look back at 4 o'clock. Look at that T-43. Look at the nose of that airplane. Smooth contour. Now take another look at that 117. Look at the nose. You see the angles all over the fuselage. Now look at that black paint, that radar absorbing paint. Because of the stealth technology of that F-117, it led Air Force airstrikes both in Desert Storm and in the present conflict. Of course, I'm joking. We were hoping to get one to go in there, but uh, three years ago, next month, the last four left Holloman Air Force Base. They have to now all be in hangars because of that stealth technology. They're out of sight of Nellis Air Force Base, so I'm afraid we won't get one to go in there. France built this Falcon on your left for the U.S. Coast Guard. Up at 1130 is a P-3 Orion submarine hunter, the prime submarine hunter for the United States Navy today. But its life is also limited. Today, Boeing aircraft has already started delivering the successor to this airplane. It's a Boeing 737 converted for anti-submarine warfare called the P-8. 10 o'clock looks like another P-3, but this has an N in front of it. stands for test. Look at that big dorsal fin in front of the vertical stabilizer. This airplane was used to monitor and track submarine launch missiles and tests. About a half a mile over there, 230, 13 B-52Hs. Those are the first B-52Hs ever to come in this image. About half are from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, the other half from Minot. The Air Force has downsized from 90 some to 70 B-52Hs. The Air Force designated 2012 as a year of the B-52. Would you believe the first B-52 flew on April 15, 1952? It's over a 60-year-old airplane. They expect to fly the ages to 2040 to 2050. It's going to be a 90 to 100 airplane. Built by Northrop. Trained thousands of Air Force pilots to fly supersonic. They expect to fly that out to about 2020 before they buy a new trainer. Now that black one has BB on the tail. It stands for Bill Air Force Base in California. That's where the Air Force flies a famous U-2 spy plane. Because of their limited flying time, the U-2 pilots maintain their skills in the 38s. 10 o'clock, Fairchild wanted to sell that T-46 as a trainer didn't happen. We have one at the National Museum of the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, as the other. 11 o'clock is a T-1C star, derivative of the famous Air Force T-33. And at 11.30, look at that huge DC-10. Used to be operated by American Airlines, then the Air Force operated it. Today it operates under the license of Raytheon Corporation. As Doug continues forward, look on the left side, you'll see a big cavity in a door back there. This airplane was used in the space defense program. They could open that door in flight, monitor and track ICBMs as well as the decoys that went into their simulated turrets. Beautiful C-135 at 10 o'clock. The last station was Commander-in-Chief Pacific Air Force's Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. The last airplane to right before we make a left turn is a B-52G. Flew 14 missions in Desert Storm War. Looks just like the H's, except the H's have turbo fans, these are turbo jets. 10 o'clock, E-21 drone, three and a half times the speed of sound. Much about that drone is classified even to this day. Now, as Doug goes down and makes a left turn on your right row, several rows of SH-60 helicopters. Nine o'clock, look at all those tankers. These are E's. Now, can you compare those airplanes at 11 o'clock, those jet engines, to the R model we just saw on the marsh rack? These are E's. These engines did not come on here. Those are turbo fans. I'm going to tell you where they came in a moment. This empty field used to be full of T-37s, 
AMARC sold them to, Air Force sold them to Pakistan, South America, and they destroyed almost the remaining ones. Look at all the S3 Vikings coming up on the right. You see the refueling boom at 9 o'clock on these oil tankers. Just beyond these S3 Vikings, you're going to see a bunch of more beach craft airplanes. Quite a few of these are trainers as well as used by embassy. Coming up at 11.30, a couple white airplanes. Keep those in mind. I'm going to tell you about them in a moment. Look at all the T-34Cs on your right. Coming up about 12.30 are some F-4 Phantom Twos. Would you believe the Air Force has now completed the 360th conversion of that F-4 into a drone? February the 25th, the vice flight was taken. It's flown to Mojave, California, where it's turned to a drone. Then it's flown back here to DM. When they're ready, that F-4 is flown to White Sands. They fire surface-to-air missiles. Others have flown to Tyndall Air Force Base, flown out of the Gulf. For about a year, that F-4 is flown with a pilot. They fly dry runs against it. Then they start shooting at it. When they start shooting, that airplane lasts about five missions. Cost $1.2 million to turn that into a drone. Kind of sad to see that airplane used that way, but a very cost-effective program. Can you imagine what it would cost to develop a brand new Mach 2 drone? Remember those F-16s I showed you when we first came in? Two years, Boeing aircraft has already started converting them in Jacksonville, Florida, into a drone, and they will eventually be shot down. Now, the folks on the right get ready for that 747. In a moment, we're going to come back by here. The folks on the left can get That's that laser airplane right there at 2 o'clock. That's a one-of-a-kind Boeing 747. It's fired that laser again. They're getting ready to start taking the on the in a moment, we come back, and the folks on the left will get a shot of that. Well, third, there's some Learjets, C-21 Learjets that are in here for modification. Then coming up on the right is a little road. This section on your right from this road to the bridge we were under a moment ago, you'll see some missiles, you'll see some airplanes out here. These are being reserved for museum duty could be the National Museum of Aviation, Naval, Air Force, Smithsonian. Now other than these assets on your right and Celebrity Road, almost everything you've seen so far may go back flying As Soon as we cross this bridge, almost everything is either going to be destroyed or it's taken off. Coming up on the right, you'll see some 135s being stripped of their parts. Look on the left, you'll see F-16s, wings missing. Now we got some folks from the UK. Many years ago, the UK developed the Harrier Jump Jet. They call them the GR series, the 7s, 8s, and 9s. We bought them for the US Marines, called them AV-8 Harriers. The UK has stored all of theirs, no longer use it. 9 o'clock, see the canopy open, AV-8 Harrier. Then at 10 o'clock, we bought many of the UK spares because the United States Marines are the only ones flying the Harriers today. WB-57, right between these 135s on the right, about 100 yards back there. Look at those huge, long wings used by the NASA. When they were flying the space shuttle, NASA flew those two WB-57s to monitor and track until they got on orbit. Coming up in a moment on your right are the B-1 bombers. We got quite a few being stripped of all their parts to maintain the ones in the fleet. Look at all the helicopters. Look at the F-16s at 930 with the wings missing tails. The third B-1 bomber, you'll see EL on the tail, stands for Ellsworth Air Force Base. The first one is DY, stands for Dias Air Force Base. Two B-1 bomber bases. On your left at 1130, you'll see a lot of the E-2s. See Hawkeyes with their radomes removed. Then coming up on the right is something you won't see much longer. 
are some F 111s. President Reagan, many years ago, directed some F 111s out of Upper Haven, Lake and Heath, England, and hit Gaddafi in Libya many years ago. Right here at 3 o'clock, you see some F 111s. They're all getting ready to be destroyed. A couple years ago, Australia was the only one who used them. They stored them, and now we have no use for them. You see those canvas objects way over there, about a half a mile? Those are GRs, Harrier jets for the England we bought them. Here are the C5s. Here's where you get a beautiful view. Got over 40 of these now. Now, until these came in, this was an empty field. Look on the left. <coughs> empty field. But about five years ago, these empty fields were full of C-141s. The Air Force determined there were no value. They brought a contractor in and they destroyed every one of those. Took them out for recycling. Commercial airliners, what are they doing here? They had turbofan engines. Do you remember those E models I showed you? They upgraded them, put them on those old E models, increased the capability 20%. Straight ahead are lots of white boxes. I'm going to tell you what's in them in a moment. Doug's going to be making a 180-degree turn in front of them in just a second. But first, I want you to look at 2 o'clock. Do you see those big tails? Now look at 3 o'clock. Do you see those four big tails? Now look in between those. Those are B-52Gs. Now look at the ones cut into pieces. You see the nose, the fuselage, the wing? The vertical stabilizers lying on the ground. AMAR has destroyed over 300 B-52s in accordance with the old strategic arms reduction talks. Not the new one. Russia has already been here to verify that we've destroyed them. Now under the new treaty, signed a year and a half ago, the United States has to destroy 39 more B-52s. They're starting to do that one a month. Now, Doug is getting ready to make a 180 degree turn. Keep your eye on the right. You'll see a, a big article right next to the road. I'm gonna tell you more of what's in these boxes in a moment and what's in that article. You see it right there on the right? There's a sign right in front of it. That is the B-2 Stealth Bomber Cockpit Master Tool. Now, Doug is gonna continue his turn. He's just gonna hustle us back to the museum. I'm going to tell you first what's in those boxes while they're here. A little bit more about that B-2 cockpit master tool. Then I'll tell you a few more facts about the boneyard. Then I'm going to open it up for any questions that you may have. But first, if we were allowed to go down that road, which we're not allowed to, we would find outer production tooling for outer production Air Force airplanes. The B-1, the B-2, the C-5, and so on. Well, your next question may be, well, what in the world is production tooling? Production tooling is anything to produce an airplane. It can be a rig, jig, stand, mold, template. Well, what's it doing in the desert? It's here in the desert for several reasons. One is cost. You can imagine what a contractor would charge the Air Force to store that material. What better place than to stick it in the boxes and put it out here in the middle of the desert? But there are a couple of much better reasons. Even though we have 3,800 airplanes, give or take, changes every day, valued at over 30 billion, $35 billion, sometimes we cannot find a part to get that airplane flying for ourselves or allies. If that be the case, we would go in and pick up the equipment and AMARC would manufacture that part to get that airplane flying again. And the last reason, someday we may go back producing an airplane again. I showed you the B-2 Stealth Bomber Cockpit Master Tool. There were only 21 built by Northrop in the 80s and 90s. Flew very successfully in the present conflict. Also, all stationed in Whiteman, Missouri. Unfortunately, one crashed on takeoff a few years ago. Out of Guam, the pilots ejected safely. 
but there are only 20. And it seems like every few years or so, Congress or somebody says, Mr. Air Force, start the production of the B-2. Now, whether that ever happens or not, no one knows. But if it did, we would go in and pick up the tooling, give it to Northrop, and they would start the production. That's what that tooling is doing here in the desert. Now, if the folks on the left will get ready, you'll be, have a good photo opportunity of this huge 747. Now, when I talk about what goes on here, the number of folks, the size of this organization, you're probably in the back of your mind saying, wow, it must cost a lot of money to operate this facility. And you're right. But would you believe while we maintain our armed forces around the world, this is actually a money saving organization? Millions and millions of dollars of parts and airplanes are flown, sold out of here every year. Good view again of that huge Boeing 747. ED on the tail stands for Edwards Air Force Base. Off the California coast is where it fired that huge laser in 2010. That program started about 1995, $5 billion has now been canceled. Now with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have about the building. Yes, sir. The gentleman is asking, are there any 141s? We have one in our museum. We may have one or so back here, but the rest of them are gone.